All right, well today we are back to work on the C6 Corvette Competition Drift Build. We're finally back in the shop getting some work done. So we've got some upgrades to do to this thing. We have what is the biggest event of the year coming up in just under a week, and we need this thing to be as good as it can possibly be. This is what we built the car for. And we're six months into the year, and we're finally going to a competition that is exactly what this car was meant for. You know, we've had comps postponed, we've had our series that we plan on competing and canceled. You know, we've been kind of run through the ringer on trying to take this car out and use it for what it's built for. We've only done one real comp in this car and that was last year when it was still not even finished. So moral of the story is we wanna make sure we are as ready as humanly possible for this event. It's the Riverside 50K event. So it's $25,000 for first. It's at the FD track in New Jersey. It takes place the week after FD. So it's all, all, everything's set up to make sure a lot of Pro 1 guys come out and a lot of Pro Spec guys come out and a lot of grassroots guys like myself from all over the country come out. It should be a pretty stacked field. There should be some seriously heavy hitters there and that is what, that's the whole reason we go to these comps is to battle those guys and that is the whole reason we built this car. We've always been outgunned when we were in this thing, you know, making 480 wheel horsepower, running a 225. Now we have all of the equipment, um, but we got to make sure it's dialed in. So that's what we're doing. We've got upgrades kind of throughout the whole car. Some suspension stuff, some chassis stuff, some aesthetic stuff that's also functional. We have managed to go to the last two events and not even take the hood off the car, but you know, the better we can make it, the more we can focus on driving and having fun. So that's the goal. Point is, we got a long list of things to do. It's gonna take us some time. So right, Osway. How are you feeling about this list? It's a good list. Just a couple things. Um, just like 10, 12 things. Yeah, yeah. You know, just a few. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of how it goes, but I got faith in us. All right, guys, before we get too deep into today's video, I wanted to talk to you about today's video sponsor, HelloFresh. So my girlfriend Chrissy and I have been using HelloFresh for going on years now. Uh, and it has been phenomenal. You know, we love the process of cooking. We enjoy cooking together and catching up on our day. It's just, at least for me, I don't like everything else that goes along with it. Trying to come up with and find a recipe, going to the store and getting the ingredients in the first place, and there's always one thing that we can't find or it's very hard to find. It's just, it's a, there's so much work involved before you even get to the cooking stage of things. Whereas HelloFresh, they eliminate all of that. They eliminate all the bad and all the time consuming stuff and you're left with just the good, the enjoyable part of cooking a meal. You get all the ingredients delivered right to your door. Everything's pre-packaged, pre-portioned, pre-planned, which means if you're like me and you're not a pro in the kitchen, you're still gonna be able to make a meal that turns out delicious because the instructions are super simple, super clear and easy to follow. It's really, it's pretty much foolproof. I think anyone could make a good tasty meal out of a HelloFresh kit. They do a really great job at getting everything together and making it simple. There's no waste. We don't end up wasting a bunch of other stuff because we got too much and not having enough. It really is just the way to go if you want to cook at home. They have like a hundred different recipes. Everything I've had has been delicious. I absolutely love it. I think it is a great way to, to eat at home, eat well, save time and save money on takeout. It's so easy to revert back to takeout because it's the easiest option. Whereas in reality, I get my HelloFresh meals done and cooked and I'm ready to eat in the time it would take me to get food delivered anyway. So for me, it's a win-win-win. If you're interested in trying it out for yourself, seeing what I'm talking about firsthand, Go to HelloFresh.com and use code TaylorDrift16 for 16 free meals plus free shipping. That's HelloFresh.com, code TaylorDrift16 for 16 free meals plus free shipping. It's definitely worth trying out, seeing what you think firsthand. So that being said, we got a lot of work to do. Not a lot of time to do it as always. Let's get back to it. All right, so what we're doing here is we are building a divider to divide the two fans. Now, there's a couple of reasons for this. Reason number one, let's say you have a fan failure. Now, we do have a spare fan, but if we needed to get through, let's say, a battle before we could change it, if one fan goes out, they both become useless. And the reason is, let's say this fan's working, this fan goes out. This fan is just going to suck air through the non-working fan and just do this continuous loop. It's easier to pull it through the big opening of the non-working fan than it is to pull it through the dense aluminum radiator. So, 
you basically have no fans if you lose one fan with an undivided shroud. Thing number two is they're both kind of fighting each other. If they're both trying to pull air, but then they're kind of trying to pull air through each other, it's not gonna work as well as if they both have their own sealed area. It may make no difference, it may make a big difference. I don't know, at a minimum, it'll be good in case we have a fan failure. Um, but best case, it'll give us better airflow through the radiator because with a drift car, all of your cooling comes from fans for the most part especially with a rear mounted radiator. So we need good working fan setup. So we're gonna try this. I'm gonna make a little divider for this, seal it all back up, and we'll, uh, we'll see if it makes a difference or not. So I'm gonna quit jibber jabber and get back to it. So to divide this shroud, we could have just cut this piece and made it a diagonal, but I wanna keep the surface area that each fan is pulling from as close to that fan's footprint as possible. So I decided to get a little extra, put a couple of bends in it, make it zigzag through the middle, and do it that way so it works a little more efficiently and you know it's a little more satisfying of a project at the end of the day so we got it bent we got it cut to shape and we got it cleaned up since we're going to be welding on it now one thing i did notice is it was sticking up a little bit past the side and in this scenario you know if we're going to have one be taller than the other we'd want the perimeter to be taller if the divider doesn't seal perfectly that's okay but if the perimeter doesn't seal perfectly it's going to leak it's going to suck air in through those gaps and it's not going to perform well so it was important that this wasn't any higher than the perimeter of the fan shroud so once we confirmed all that got it into shape got it all fitted nicely we went ahead and welded it in i just stitch welded it because i didn't want to warp the main shroud this shroud is a much much thinner aluminum which is why i preheated the divider i wanted to avoid <laughs> warping it to some extreme so while i was working on that josue was building a backing plate for our expansion tank. Since we're mounting it to a carbon fiber firewall, we need a big backing plate to kind of spread that load out so we're not mounting it directly to two small points on the firewall. So while he was finishing up that so we can mount our expansion tank, I was resealing our shroud with this weather stripping. This is a super important step with a fan shroud, it has to be sealed. Otherwise, the air will just take the path of least resistance around all the cracks and not through your radiator core and just be wasted. Action! Oh, hold on, hold on, hold on. Scene three, take four, radiator, fan shroud, install. Action. All right. <laughs> Where's the bolt? Where's the hardware? I, I just, I put them somewhere. And wherever I put them, I thought I'm going to lose these. Start right here. I found them. Very safe place. I found them, dude. Relax. Chill. 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 So we decided to also weather strip around the radiator itself. So we basically got double weather stripping here to really seal this up and we kind of overshot it. It was a little bit too thick to get everything to touch. That's the tough part is the divider needs to touch, but not too much. It doesn't need to be squishing against the radiator and the perimeter needs to touch. So it was challenging to get that perfect, but we got it where we wanted it. And then we moved on to mounting the expansion tank. Now we want to mount this as high as possible. So it's easy to bleed all the air out of the system and it's the highest point. But obviously if we mount it too high, then it's going to interfere with the hatch. So it was a little tricky finding that point, but we managed to get it right up top as high as we could without interfering with the hatch and having to worry about that. So then we could move on to putting our fan setup back together. We got the shroud on and then went ahead and started bolting the fans on. Now, fortunately, I used rib nuts for this. So instead of having to get behind it with a nut and hold a wrench on there and have to put the fans on before the shroud, just bolt the fans on into blind fasteners. Handy. Fans are back on with our, you can kind of see it in there, divided shroud. They definitely seem to be pulling harder. I think that's gonna make a pretty big difference. We also got our header expansion tank installed. We were able to get it higher than our swirl pot. So basically what this does is the water is returning to the radiator. It swirls through here and then goes and feeds the radiator. So that way the air comes out the top. So we're gonna end up welding a fitting on here and then that's gonna pull them to the expansion tank. So ideally all the air will come out and into the expansion tank, which is our highest point in the system. That's the concept, at least. Big old honking intake. All right, so I've got my laptop. Uh, I'm gonna work on my power steering pump settings. Right now, it turns on when the engine is running. So once, it sees, once the engine sees RPM, it turns the power steering pump on. And that's so that way it's not killing the battery if you just have the ignition on while you're doing tuning or things like that. Now the problem is, if the engine stalls, which we've had happen, it's pretty easy to pop start it, 
but it takes the power steering pump about five seconds to come online and build pressure back up. So then you have no power steering, which is very hard to drive with on a car like this. So I'm gonna see if I can find a setting that will make it stay on even if the engine stalls. But not come on until the engine's running so that way it's not killing the battery while we're just sitting there. So this way is gonna start working on a rack brace. The mount on this side of the rack here is this little dinky stamped steel piece and it can break. So this brace basically just grabs it from another point uh, to strengthen it, keep it from breaking. So something we've been meaning to do for a while, we just kind of keep forgetting about it. So as so we got into working on getting this rack brace in, now it's a little bit tricky because when we built the car, you know, we didn't plan around this. We didn't know we were gonna use this. So it is a little tough to get to. There's a lot of stuff in the way because it, it wasn't planned for. So we went ahead and lifted the car up, took a look at all the rubber that came out of the radiator when we blew it out. It was a lot of rubber. All right, well, we were working on installing the rack brace. Our original chassis we started with was a true aluminum Z06. Z06s come with a magnesium subframe. And for whatever reason, apparently it's different, which, you know, we only found out about after we started trying to install it. But uh, either way, this is not gonna work. Probably gonna be our next project is redoing this line here. So the reason this is overly long is because we have a dry break here and a dry break here. Now the idea is if we ever were to get into a front end crash and tear up our oil cooler or something where we really need it, when we need to warm the car up on a cold day, we could pop that one, pop that one, connect it, bypass the oil cooler and help with warming up the car at the track. So that was the idea. The problem is to make the lines long enough to reach each other, they have to be way too long to go from A to B. So we're gonna put an intermediate line that's gonna basically, we'll disconnect this and then put like a third line in, in between so we can shorten all this up and make it look nicer. So this so way starting on our new line. What I'm gonna do is start working on pulling the transmission out. And that's because we're gonna be swapping the transmission. This is our GSR dog box. Now it's still working perfectly, but we have done a lot of events on it. I have done some wonky shifts where I thought I blew it up a couple times now. I'm gonna be honest on that. Just misshifted, it sounded like I blew it up and it was, it was fine. But, you know, this is the biggest event of the year for us. This is what we built this car for. This is what we've been waiting all year for was to do these Riverside 50Ks. They were the main competitions we had planned for this year. So we wanna make sure this thing is A1 and we don't wanna have to swap transmission at the track. Now, fortunately, I have a spare and this is a pretty cool feeling for me. I never knew if I'd ever be able to buy a dog box, let alone a spare dog box which we have right here, I haven't even opened it. So we're gonna open it together. Let you guys share in the uh, satisfaction and open a fresh, brand new dog box. All right, are you guys ready for this? Ta-da! This is why I wanted to open it before I pull it down when I want to make sure, you know, the shifter offset's correct because we have kind of an oddball shifter offset. So we have 26 inch shifter offset. Most guys run 24, but you'll see a lot of guys, they have to have like a shifter extension um, to, to make it reach back. So we just went 26. I mean, this is one of the single biggest improvements of this car from the Miata is the, the dog box, the transmission, being able to just row the gears and know it's gonna go in every time, unless you do something really silly, which I have done before, <laughs> um, and that it's gonna handle the abuse, and it's small, and it's light, and it's serviceable. I'm excited to take that one apart. Yeah. Take it apart, see what, see what we've done to it in 15, 12, 15 events. We've done a lot of driving on that car so far, and we haven't touched the transmission besides fluid changes. So get in here, take a gander at this thing. Look at that billet shifter rail. Like I said, I can't tell you how cool it feels to have two of these things. <laughs> I remember sitting in, in college class when I went to college for a short period of time and, and thinking like, what can I do to save up enough money to get some form of a dog box? You know, that was freaking A. It, Goals. Uh, 10, 12 years ago now, 10, 11 years ago. And here we are. Pretty, uh, pretty neat. It's cool they come with these really nice boxes because you know, we'll put the, the other one will now become our spare and we'll put it in this same box for what we'll take it with us. We've been taking this one the last few events, but I mean, granted, hopefully we never have to open this box at the track. Nope. Look how light this thing is. You're feeling strong? Oh, he's strong. I mean, it's nothing. It's so light. <laughs> it is. But this one has all the upgrades. The only thing it doesn't have that ours has, ours has all the upgrades. This one doesn't have the tool steel selector shaft. 
uh, just because I didn't have any. Other than that, it's decked out, you know? All right, well, before we yank the transmission out, we need to start this thing up, let it warm up a little bit, and just get the fluid cycling so we can drain the oil so we can take the line off, the filter housing, and start dealing with all that. Coming down! <laughs> Hurry up! Don't rush me. So this clear view filter housing, if we Take a little air chuck, put a touch of air to it. We can push the oil back down. So while Josue started draining the oil and getting everything ready to take these lines apart and make new lines, I went back to work on trying to change this power steering on parameter. Now it's really tricky to find a condition that is still gonna be there when the engine stalls for a few seconds but not be there when you just turn the key on. So what I settled on was exhaust gas temperature. It should take a few seconds for it to drop off. So ideally now, if we do stall the car on entry, which has only happened twice, and, and I know why it's happened, but if we do, the pump won't turn off immediately. So I got that all set up and then started working on cleaning out the filter housing. We haven't taken this off in quite a few oil changes. So taking it off, getting it all cleaned out, all fresh and new while we're in here making these new lines. And then I started working on getting ready to pull the transmission out. Now, to pull this transmission, we need to tilt the engine back some. Now, this car, being a race car, everything is solid mounted. The turbo is mounted to the chassis. All of the pipes mounted to the turbo are solid. There's no real give anywhere. So we can't tilt the engine back without disconnecting something. Something's got to give to be able to tilt it back. So I decided to pull basically the cold side pipe off and the Y pipe off, the, the hot side to the turbo, and that should allow us to tilt the engine back. Now, while I was doing that, Josue was getting the lines made to redo this whole line situation. This is something we've wanted to do for so long, and I wish we had thought about it in the beginning, but we're doing it now, and that's what counts. No more ugly lines sticking way out and having this super silly route. Nice, fresh, clean, short routing. Much better. Can't hardly hear me because of the dang rain, but that's a lot better. So now we'll build a line where we would disconnect this, hook the line there, and hook it up here. So we wrapped up for the day, and the next morning I decided to get to work on kind of a solo project while I wait for Josue to get there so we can pull that transmission together. I went ahead and drained the swirl pot so I could remove it because I need to weld on this 6AN fitting, which had also finally come in. So I marked my hole, I drilled it. I like to use these counter sinks just to kind of deburr the holes, and then I put the fitting in and I use this center punch to hold the fitting perfectly center over the hole. It's so tricky with aluminum, you go to weld and you'll just easily knock it right off or right out of place with the TIG rod. So having something to hold it perfectly in line was the ideal scenario. So with that welded up, I could go ahead and reinstall it and hook everything back up. Now we still need to make the 6AN line from the swirl pot to the expansion tank and the 10AN line from the expansion tank to the radiator, but at least it's all in there, all the hard parts are there. So now that Josue's in, we can go ahead and pull this transmission out. Now we have never taken this transmission out since we built the car. We put the transmission in and it has not come out. I built this exhaust and kind of tried to design everything to be as easy as I could make it to pull this out because it is something that might break and might have to get fixed at the track. But this is gonna be our first trial run of pulling this thing out in the car. So it's gonna be a learning experience and we're gonna see just how easy it really is. So we pulled the exhaust section off. It's a bigger section than I wanted originally, but wasn't too bad with two people. And then we could get the drive shaft taken out and out of the way. And then it's basically loosen the motor mounts so we can tilt the engine back because they are also solid. So if you just take the transmission mount out, they'll still hold everything up. And then we could take the transmission mount out and then let this thing tilt back so we can gain access to the bolts and have room to pull it out. So hopefully this all comes out with all these lines in place. I don't think they were even there when we built it. So our fingers are crossed that it comes out. And fortunately it does. It came out about as easy as I could have hoped it would. Slipped right out, no issues. Alrighty, well that was not too bad. You can see in there, see our throttle bearing. 
set up. Now we're not gonna pull the bell housing right now. I wanted to, at the same time that we were swapping the spare transmission in, do new clutch discs, but I couldn't get the right ones in time. And I need to verify for sure which ones I have. Either option I couldn't get in time, but I need to also make sure I get the right option when I do order them. But it's out. You can kind of see some of the tunnel stuff here. Boom, boom, that's our little plate there. Uh, and then the transmission side by side. So one thing that's cool is now that we have this out, you know, we've verified our, our depth works. You can maybe see that. Basically, that's the splines for one disc, two discs, three discs, four discs. So, you know, an issue we had on the Sephiro is the one disc was past the input shaft, but these are all nice, nice, good engagement. One thing, the shifter is a little bit different. This one's like the higher rise shifter than this one that's flat and laid back. So I'm hoping we don't run into clearance issues. We don't really know till we put it in there. But yeah, never thought I'd have one dog box, let alone two of them. Remember, we gotta go up at an angle. Pretty aggressive angle like this. Yeah, beautiful. Alright, try to go in if you can. Like nothing. All right, well, unfortunately, as we kind of expected, the different shifter rod does hit when it's all the way up. So we've got two options here. We can grab the shifter setup off our other transmission here, swap it over, but A, this is all nicely safety wired, but B, more importantly, this is all set up for basically the shifter having the right amount of throw, not too much throw. This is all set up at G-Force by the factory. They dynoed it. I prefer not to have to tinker with swapping them if I can get away with it. So I think what we're gonna do is just go ahead and modify the transmission tunnel and our cover plate here. We don't have to do much to either of them. Just a little slit here just to clear this joint and then opening up this hole a little bit and, and then making kind of a new rounded cover. And then we should be able to run this as is. And that way, whichever transmission we have as they sit right now will fit in the car. I think that's the way to do it. Uh, that's what we're gonna try. So let's see, take this apart and then get to cutting. So while I was measuring and debating whether or not we were going to commit on cutting this transmission tunnel, Josue was working on his final line for the cooling system so that we could get this all plumbed and finished and all the hard parts would be done. So we know that's one more thing we can cross off the checklist and keep plugging away at this. So we got those in, they all fit well. It's now a bit of a line city back there. And then we decided to commit on cutting the tunnel out. So I decided to take kind of a small bite at first, cut as little out as possible. The less I cut, the less I've got to cover up with a nice sealed plate later. So I cut out a small chunk. We left the transmission in there so that once we had the cut done, we could just bolt it back up in place and check our clearances. And unfortunately, the first cut is nowhere near enough. So I decided to cut a little bit more out and then we were gonna test that, put the transmission back up into place and it's close. It's close, but not quite close enough. Once it's all bolted up, it still runs into some interference with the shifter. So I kept cutting little by little until I had enough clearance to make sure that we were never going to make contact even if things shifted it around a little bit and then we could go ahead and finalize this transmission get all the bell housing bolts done drive shaft back in all of that good stuff now with this project we are bouncing around a little bit and one thing we wanted to get done early was filling the cooling system we wanted to make sure that we were able to bleed it and that we didn't have any leaks so that way that problem didn't sneak up on us last minute when we're getting ready to throw this thing in the trailer All right, cooling system is finished up. It is fully bled. You can see our vent line there. Boom, to our header tank, which is above our swirl pot here that should get all the air out and into the header tank. And then we've got a feed line from there, 10 a.m. to the top corner of the radiator over here. We got no leaks, but it primed it. Everything seems good there, so we'll get to see how that works out. So that's done and dusted, crossed off the checklist. Transmission is fully situated in place. Had to cut a larger opening than we expected, but uh, it's done, it's dusted, that's all good. The drive shaft is back in, transmission mount hooked back up, motor mounts tightened down. The only thing left for that is to put the exhaust back in, but we're gonna do some additional heat shielding 
while we have it out. Now I need to build a new cover plate or modify my cover plate. One thing we did have to do is ditch our bracket here. So we had this bracket with our chill out controller and our boost control knob, uh, but it's obviously no longer gonna fit. So we toss that. We're gonna put the chill out controller here on this transmission tunnel cover plate. And then I relocated the boost control knob down to under the dash. I don't really mess with this that much. And I don't really need to see where it's at because I have that displayed on the dash, the percentage. So that's where I look for it anyway, because sometimes you can get kind of stuck in between selections and it'll go back to zero. So I always check it on there anyway. So this re really worked out here. I honestly ended up forcing us to clean up the uh, interior some. I never liked that bracket. So yeah, that being said, my next order of business is to modify my cover plate to get this all sealed back up. And then we can put everything back together in here. This way is probably gonna work on the heat shielding. We gotta get fluids back in it, uh, both in the transmission and the engine. We need to do a gear change. We did mount a fresh pair of Nitto NT01 front tires. Been running the same pair since we built the car. I love these tires. They still had some life in them, but we knew we were gonna flat spot them when we uh, drove this thing on the oval, flat spot the inside tire. So we wanted to put our fresh set on before, before this comp. So jibber jabber, point is <laughs> we got a lot of stuff checked off the uh, to-do list, but we still got a lot to do. So I'm gonna quit jibber jabbering, get back to work. Definitely one of the worst things to have to do as a fabricator when you're building a car is to take a fully finished piece that's painted and done and works and hack it up and modify it but that's what we got to do it's not that big of a deal it's a pretty simple plate now we could build it all over again but again we're operating on a little bit of a time crunch here we don't have a ton of time to do this so we're just going to take the easy route and modify the plate we have we know it fits We've got all the, the mounting holes that line up, so we're gonna modify it and make it work. So to do the cover, we need something that's tall and tapers down. So I decided to take this piece of scrap exhaust tubing and cut it to be our cover for the rod itself because it kind of naturally tapers down and should look pretty nice and clean. So I get it cut out, get it cleaned up, and then we've gotta to try to clean all the paint off of this cover panel because when we weld it, it's gonna get hot, it's gonna destroy the paint anyway, and it's gonna leave a, a bit of a, a toxic mess. So we got it cleaned up, we test fitted everything in place and marked it so we could pull it out and tack it. That's one thing with fab work, it's a lot of taking things in and out. If you want them to fit right at the end, you've gotta kinda of test fit every step of the way. So once I had it tacked, I re-test fitted it and then it was time to make this little plate for the end for the mounting holes. We already have two rib nuts there for the bracket that we had to get rid of, so it's the perfect place to attach this thing. Now, the funny thing is this piece that I'm using is actually the scrap from cutting out the shifter hole originally on this plate that we're modifying. So it's, it's getting repurposed. It was the only thing I had that was the right thickness without cutting a new piece out of the sheet. And again, we're trying to do this fast. We're trying to get this project done quickly. Will I redo it later? Maybe, but for now it needs to work and be halfway decent. So we threw a coat of paint on it. It gets mostly covered by a shift boot, so I'm not too worried about it looking perfect, but it actually came out pretty good. And then I can start working on bolting everything back up to finalize the transmission swap. So we need to get the Y pipe hot side back in. It's a little bit tricky because all of this is solid mounted so there is no give anywhere and as this stuff heats up and cools down it expands and contracts and it moves and uh, it's tough to get all these flanges to perfectly line up with each other so Raldo helped me kind of shimmy things around get everything hooked up get the cold side back in and then I can go ahead and seal this plate up now that the paint is finally dried and make sure that we don't get any air fire any of that stuff coming in the cabin we want this to be sealed just like the radiator shroud for a number of reasons so i took my time put a bunch of foam on there and then we got it bolted back in and got to finally see what the final product looked like after all this work modifying this same thing all right well shifter plate came out pretty good i'm pretty happy with that overall it's all back together it's all sealed up nicely shifters back in handbrake digital dash actual dash you can see our boost control knob nice and hidden over, under there, not staring you in the face, our chill out controller. Overall, pretty happy with this. It really, at, at the end of the day, kind of cleaned up the interior more than anything. So I went ahead and also mounted a handheld Novec fire extinguisher. That's the same suppressant agent we use in our fire suppression system. I've been wanting to buy one of these for a while, but Pegasus didn't have any in stock. They had two in stock, so I bought one for this car and one for the uh, Drift F80. The idea is if we have a small fire, we have a handheld deal, we can pop out put the fire out and not have to discharge our whole suppression system. So anyway, with that, interior is pretty well wrapped up. Transmission swap's pretty well done. 
Got the hot side back in, cold side back in, lines all hooked back up, intakes back on. Basically what's left is to fill fluids and we still gotta put the second portion of the exhaust back on. So we went ahead and did some heat shielding on the tunnel while it was out. So we'll toss that back in, start filling fluids. All right, Josue? Josue got all our tires mounted already. Me, Raldo, and Josue got them put in the trailer. Cruising right along. We did realize that we are completely out of one ethanol. We, I thought, thought we had plenty left. We've been uh, drinking this stuff down like water, so we gotta go get another barrel tomorrow. Fill up our, our fuel jugs. Jibber jabber. We're gonna get back to it. Gonna put the exhaust in and then start tossing fluids in it and do a gear change. Oh, this thing is finally coming back together. It feels good when you tackle a big project that's bigger than you think to really start finally putting everything back in. So we worked on getting the exhaust back in and then this was tricky just like the top for the same reasons. This does have a slip joint, but it was just really, really tight to get it hooked back up to the flanges. There's no give anywhere in this system besides those slip joints. So everything has to be perfect. If it moves at all, it's not gonna line up. And if you move anything upstream, it's not gonna line up. So it was a little, a little challenging, but luckily there's three of us. We got it into place, then we went ahead and pulled the gears out. We're dropping our wheel speed a little bit for this track that we're going to this weekend. That's one of the other biggest upgrades of this car compared to the Miata is being able to dial in the wheel speed. I don't know if it's right. I've never driven this track, but it should be close. So we went ahead and put the old transmission in the box for the new transmission. That way we can bring it with us as a spare. We are gonna take it apart and service it. We just don't have time right now. We're on a time crunch. So we know it works, we'll have it with us. So then we can move on to filling the final system, the oil system. Now, since we drained everything, the lines, the filter, the housing, we need to prime this system. Now, this being a dry sump, basically I have a little cog set up that goes into the drill and I use a belt to spin the pump over just like the engine would, pull oil all the way through the system till it's back to the tank and we know we're good and primed. systems go went through all the gears these tires this wheels are a little big for a little tight mm. a little, little tight on the fitment side of things in here um but i mean you know then just kind of move around so it's like you know. clearances itself a little bit yeah something like that <laughs> all right well all we have left now is to load everything in the trailer so then we got to work on the shark. They do fuel filters, oil change, make sure she's ready. So we're going to clean this thing off. It hasn't been cleaned since before. We took it to FD Orlando, so it's, you can kind of see, dirty. So. Still rinse. Hot enough, chipper jabber.
All right, well, that pretty much wraps us up. Car is loaded, ready to go. It is a scorcher today here in Florida. So we got everything on our list accomplished that we wanted to get done, besides the front tow hook, because we had cut a hole in the bumper and we didn't want to we didn't want to rush that. Car's loaded. We're going to do some maintenance to the tow rig. Hopefully that goes well. Look everything back up and get ready to rock and roll. So for now, that is going to be a wrap. So stay tuned for the first real trip with the Mega Cab. Fingers crossed we actually make it to our destination this time, unlike our last long trip. And uh, first, uh, first real big deal comp in the vet of the year. So stay tuned for all that for now. I'm going to go ahead and end it here. So thanks for watching. Thanks for subscribing. Goodbye.